name is David Ewan, and I'm here by the permission and the request of my spiritual father, Pastor Jose Martinez, and my spiritual mother, Pastor Melly Martinez, here at the Resurrection Center. Our website is resurrectionspringfield.org. You can also check us out on your Alexa and other smart devices by just saying, play the podcast, Resurrection Center of Springfield. If you're looking for prayer, our phone number is 413-342-0354. And for the, those that are at home and for those that are here, we're going to rise up, if you may, so that we may give reverence to the Lord. Yes. I will read three scriptures that covers our title, New Beginnings, today, and then I will pray. So the three scriptures are, first one, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And in John chapter 11, verse 25 through 26, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? And in Romans chapter 8, verse 34, Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Dear Lord, I thank you for this word. And I pray that today's message, New Beginnings, fills the hearts of those in need. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. So why are we here today? Why are you watching today? There's a purpose for that. It's because you're looking for something. You're looking for new beginnings. Easter is the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus from the tomb on the third day of crucifixion. Easter is the fulfilled prophecy of the Messiah. It's a prophecy. It's a prophecy of the Messiah who would be persecuted, die for our sins, and rise on the third day. And that's what we're celebrating today. Remembering the resurrection of Jesus is a way to renew daily hope that we have victory over sin. And that's why today, it's a new beginning. So, the week leading up to Easter is called the Holy Week. For example, there's Palm Sunday, the day Jesus entered Jerusalem and was celebrated. There, of course, was the Last Supper, where Jesus met his disciples. And, of course, Good Friday, when Jesus would be crucified on the cross. And today, we're talking about Easter, which is also Resurrection Sunday. So, what are the ways that we remember the importance of this? First of all, in the days of the past, of 2,000 years ago, parables and stories were given so that we could remember them. There was also acts of prophecy so that we could remember them. These items are of significance important. So during the Last Supper feast, Jesus told his disciples that bread symbolizes his body that would be broken, and the wine, his blood, which would be poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Whose sins? Our sins. We're going to talk more about that. So, you may not know this, but we've been given a gift. We have a gift. Easter is a very significant date within Christianity and is the foundation of the Christian faith. Did you hear me say that? Easter is the foundation of the Christian faith. Without the events, the historical, factual events of Easter, there is no Christianity. So Jesus, the Son of God, fulfilled prophecy, and through his death at crucifixion, has given the gift of eternal life in heaven. We have that promise. That's why when we talk about the word, what is the word? The word is the promise. What is the promise? It's the eternal life in heaven to those who believe in his death and resurrection. That's what we're talking about. Now let me tell you, this week... You've been looking at the news. It's been a tough week. You've heard about it, coronavirus. 
It's been a very bad week. We're at peak now. You hear about that. You hear about New York. You hear about Boston. So corona relates to crown in terms of how it looks under an electron microscope. Well, did you know about 2,000 years ago that it was a tough week, too, for Jesus? Did you know that? Did you know that? So about 2,000 years ago, it was a tough week for Jesus. He wore a crown, too, but it was with thorns. And you didn't need an electron microscope to see it. You could see it, okay? And why did he do that? It was obedience to prophecy. That's why he did that. It explained Christianity. And he explained Christianity during the Last Supper. He was crucified, and he was resurrected on the third day. So let's talk about, bring yourself closer to me. You at home, come over here. In John chapter 1, verse 29, I want to tell you about what the real meaning of Easter is. In John chapter 1, verse 29, As he sees Jesus approaching, John the Baptist announces to the crowd around him, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He knew that Jesus was the Son of God, the long-awaited Messiah, the one whom God prophets had promised to save mankind from their sins and to give them a deep, heartfelt relationship with the God, the Father. The new covenant would be an everlasting covenant. See, John the Baptist was already ready. People knew who he was. But there are those who weren't. But that was part of prophecy because that would be the reason why he would be crucified. So Jesus became our sacrificial lamb, our savior, our God, our redeemer. He laid down his life as our sacrificial lamb to pay for our sins. When he rose from the dead three days later, he gave victory over the eternal separation from God. The separation from God, what is that? That's death. He gave us that victory. And it was for all who put their faith and trust in him. That's the new covenant. See, we were given a new covenant. Everlasting life spent with God through faith in all that Jesus Christ has done and continues to do to this very day. The meaning of Easter is Jesus Christ's victory over death. Isn't that something you want? Victory over death? Do you want everlasting life? That's what Jesus Christ gives us. His resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus, symbolizes the eternal life that is granted to all who believe in him. The meaning of Easter also symbolizes the complete verification of all that Jesus preached and taught during his three-year ministry. Just three years. That's all his ministry was. If he had not risen from the dead, if he had merely died and not been resurrected, he would only have been considered just another teacher or another rabbi. However, his resurrection changed all that and gave final and irrefutable proof that he was really the Son of God and that he had conquered death once and for all. That had never happened before. Today, the meaning of Easter for all Christians is that honoring and recognizing Jesus Christ's resurrection from the dead, and his glorious promises of eternal life for all who believe in him. Christians know that Easter is very central to our faith. And in fact, it's one of the earliest uh, followers of Jesus had declared, without Easter, there is no Christianity. We talked about that before. So what exactly does Easter celebrate that's so important? Hmm. It's kind of like the scientist's. Simply put, Easter is the day when Christians commemorate Jesus' resurrection. Resurrection, as you may know, is the name given to the process by which someone who is dead comes back to life, being resurrected. So on Easter, Christians remember that Jesus, who we believe died some 2,000 years ago, rose from the, the grave and lived again. 
That's why today's message is called New Beginnings. New Beginnings. And if we study, and did you hear me say I talked about the word study? If we study what Jesus teaches us and what God provides in his word, and if we renew ourselves, then we ourselves can have new beginnings even in present day. That's why it is important that we recognize what Jesus gave us because every day we can have a new beginning, a better day tomorrow. The Bible explains that Jesus was one with God. And though he was God, he wore human flesh and experienced what we experienced. So if I feel pain, he can feel pain. But he endures. And though he was God, he wore human flesh. But there was one major exception. Jesus lived a completely holy and sinless life. I'll tell you, that wasn't me. But but it was Jesus, and that's who we follow. Therefore, when Jesus died, he satisfied God's requirement of perfection. I didn't. I don't know if you have, but I didn't. But when Jesus died, he satisfied God's requirement of perfection. So by living a holy life and dying on our behalf, Jesus reversed the consequences of death. That means he reversed not being with God. We have the opportunity. Did did you hear me say opportunity? I, I didn't say guarantee. We have the opportunity, should we choose it and believe in him, to have the eternal life with our God. Think of it. It's opportunity to have that new beginning. Through this act, Jesus gave humanity a supreme gift. Sent by God, his Father, he lived the perfect life that we humans could not live. Then he died on our behalf. In so doing, he gave his perfect life to us so that we could be reconciled to God and experience life as it was meant to be. And if you don't know what it's meant to be, then you will because today is your new beginning. And we're going to talk about that. Okay? Um, So God, through the person of Christ, loved us enough to enable humanity to experience a restored relationship with his creator now and forever. Did you hear me say that? Now and forever. That means here on this earth and in eternity. That's what we're talking about. So let's break it down. I'm going to break it down. I'm going to talk about three things today. Three things. Here's what we're going to deal with. Number one, I'm going to make it easy for you. I'm going to give you the logical explanation of Easter. What is that? What is Easter? What's it meant to be? What's it supposed to be in my heart? Okay. Number two. I'll talk about the Easter Bible story, but simplified, okay? Because we got to get our big arms around that big tree trunk because it's a complicated story. So I'll talk about that. Then I'm going to do the fun part. Yes, we're going to have some fun. The fun part is the Easter story as told in scriptures. So why am I telling you the Easter story as told through scriptures? Because I didn't make up the story. It's a true story. We're going to be talking about Easter today as it was described thousands of years ago. So this isn't new. So again, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a logical explanation of Easter. Then number two, the Easter Bible story simplified. And number three, the Easter story is told through scriptures. So let's begin. So here's an abbreviated logical explanation of what we learned through the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Make it simple. God is holy. Humanity is not. Let me do that again. God is holy. Humanity is not. See how that works? Holiness and unholiness cannot coexist. That is why God is holy and humanity is not. This opposition caused infinite brokenness in humanity's relationship with God. 
See what our sin has done? So because we're incapable of holy living as a result of sin, God must satisfy that requirement on our behalf. God has to fix it for us. So Jesus, who was one with God, lived a holy, sinless life. So here's what happened. Jesus died on our behalf, and by satisfying the requirement of holiness, he reversed the effects of our broken relationship with God, making reconciliation and connection with him possible forever. Do you like how that works? He helped us. He gave us the gift. He made it possible. Why? Because that's what God wants. All we have to do is be obedient. But I'm going to be telling you how we learned that. I'm going to tell you about the Easter Bible story. So the four things, it's four chapters, real simple, real simple. Number one, I'll talk about the Last Supper. Okay, I'll talk about the Last Supper. And then number two, Judas betrays Jesus. Yes, there was betrayal. Betrayal's part of this. So yes, there was sin to make this all happen. Number three, the crucifixion of Jesus. And number four, the resurrection of Jesus. See, those are the four things. Number one, the Last Supper. Number two, the betrayal. Judas betrays Jesus. Number three, the crucifixion of Jesus. And number four, the resurrection of Jesus. So let's begin with the Last Supper. As the disciples reclined and ate dinner, nom, 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 he explained to them that one of the 12 of them would soon betray him. That was part of the little talk at the dinner table. One by one, the disciples denied that it would be them, including Judas, who would be the betrayer. So Jesus responded that the person who betrays him will have a terrible fate, and indeed that was Judas. That's the Last Supper. So what happened was Jesus prayed and thanked God for the meal. He then broke the bread shared the wine with the disciples, and explained to them how the bread was a symbol of his body. It was broken for them, and the wine was a symbol of his blood, which would be poured out for their sins to be forgiven. Did you hear me say forgiven? This is where the church's tradition of communion comes from. That's why it's called an act of remembrance because it's the first part of the Easter story, the Last Supper, communion. So when you take part in that act, you're taking part in the very first part of the Easter story. Number two, Judas betrays Jesus. Yep. During the meal of the Last Supper, Jesus predicts that one of you will betray me. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being at, at a table with... 12 disciples, and one of you will betray me. Wow, the thickness in that room. Can you imagine that? And he was referring to Judas. So Judas leaves the supper, goes to the Roman authorities who are looking to arrest Jesus. He accepts a bribe of just 30 silver and agrees to take them to Jesus. Judas knew that Jesus and the disciples would go to a garden near Jerusalem, led the soldiers there, stating, whoever it is, I kiss. He is the one. Take him into custody and lead him away under guard. That's what he says. So leading the group into the garden, Judas sees Jesus with his disciples and approaches him. Greetings, rabbi. That means greetings, teacher. Greetings, rabbi. Judas says and kisses Jesus very lightly. Fellow, for what purpose are you present? Jesus responds. And that's in Matthew chapter 26, verse 49 through 50. And answering his own question, Jesus says, Judas, are you betraying the Son of God with a kiss? As the soldiers moved towards Jesus, the apostles recognized what was happening. Lord, should we strike with the sword, they ask? And that's in Luke chapter 22, verse 49. Before Jesus can respond, Peter uses one of the two swords that the apostles have and attacks Malchus. He's a servant of the Most High Priest, cutting off his right ear. Jesus caresses the ear of Malchus, healing the wound. He then teaches an important lesson, telling Peter, return your sword to its place, 
for all those who take up the sword will perish by the sword. Jesus is willing to be captured, for he explains, how would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must take place this way? And that's in Matthew 26, 52. Then this leads to the trial and crucifixion of Christ. Jesus stopped the possible attempt that would have prevented the crucifixion. He knew that he needed to be crucified. He knew that was prophecy. He knew that that's why he was there. So even though he had the great followers, he even had to stop those that thought it was harmful. But it was necessary. The third part, the crucifixion of Jesus. Jesus had prophesied of his death in Matthew, and it's from a, in Matthew it says, from that time on Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. And that's in Matthew. Jesus understood that his life would be required as a sacrifice for the sins of man. Why was it required? Because with that, without that sacrifice, if that did not happen, we would lose that connection with God. That promise of eternal life would not have happened. Jesus knew he had to be crucified. He had to sacrifice what you and I, as normal carnal flesh, could not. He knew it was necessary. So what happened was... Jesus had a crown of thorns thrust on his head, and he was made to carry his cross. He had to carry a burden towards his crucifixion. Not only was he being crucified, not only did he have to make a huge sacrifice, he had to carry the burden of it, and that's what carrying the cross was a burden, what was a symbolic of, okay? And along the pathway to the hill, he would be crucified. The location of the crucifixion, as you may know, is known as Calvary. So you see, the crucifixion of Jesus was part of God's plan from the very beginning of the birth of Jesus. The sin of mankind would require a sacrifice. The sinless life of Jesus was lived and given so that man could receive salvation and eternal life in heaven. And the fourth part, the resurrection of Jesus, which is the reason why we're all here today. That's why today is called Resurrection Sunday. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the foundation of the Christian faith. Without the resurrection, the belief in God's saving grace through Jesus is destroyed. When Jesus rose from the dead, he confirmed his identity as the Son of God. And his work of atonement, redemption, reconciliation, and salvation. The resurrection was a real, literal, physical raising of Jesus' body from the dead. You see, what happened is Jesus was arrested and tried and found guilty of claiming to be a king. See, I guess they didn't like that. His body was hung on a cross between two thieves. After his death, Jesus' body was wrapped in linen cloths and placed in a tomb with a large stone rolled across the opening. On the third day, on an early Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene and another Mary came to the tomb and found it empty. Sitting on the rolled away stone was an angel of the Lord who told them to not be afraid because Jesus had risen. As the woman left to tell the disciples, Jesus Christ met them and showed them his nail pierced hands. So that's the story of Easter. But now I'm going to tell you how true it is. Because it is true. Why would I tell you otherwise? So I'm going to be telling you the Easter story very simply as it's told through scriptures. Okay? So get your Bibles ready. I'm going to go quick. So here's the Easter story as told in scriptures. I'm going to first talk about Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. 
So this is Matthew chapter 21, verse 7 through 9. Matthew chapter 21, verse 7 through 9. So I'll read this. Matthew chapter 21, verse 7 through 9. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting. So that's in Matthew chapter 21, verse 7 through 9. And the next part is Judas agrees to betray Jesus. Wouldn't you be like a, a fly on the wall to hear that conversation? So and that's in Matthew chapter 26, verse 14 through 15. Matthew chapter 26, verse 14 through 15. And the scripture reads, Then one of the twelve whose name was Judas went to the chief priests and said, what will, you, what will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. Really? And from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray him. So for 30 silver, that's what he did. That's in Matthew chapter 26, verse 14 through 15. And the next one, the Last Supper, that's in Matthew chapter 26 through 8, uh, I should say, Matthew chapter 26, verse 18. Matthew 26, verse 18. He said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. It was all part of prophecy. And the next one. Remember we talked about the garden? The garden... Uh, Gethsemane, the Garden of Gethsemane. And so I'll be reading Matthew chapter 26. So it's Matthew chapter 26, and it's verse 36 and 39. So chapter 26 of Matthew, verse 36 and 39. So here's verse 36. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto his disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And verse 39 says, And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And the next one, Jesus delivered to Pilate. And that's in Matthew chapter 27, verse 1 through 2. Uh, Jesus delivered to Pilate. Matthew chapter 27, verse 1 through 2. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death, and they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate, the governor. And that's in Matthew chapter 27, verse 1 through 2. Now let's talk about Jesus' final steps. Jesus' final steps. So I'll read from John chapter 19, verse 6, and also Matthew chapter 27, verse 30 through 31. So I'll say that again. Two books. John chapter 19, verse 6, and Matthew chapter 27, verse 30 through 31. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, crucify him, crucify him. And that's John chapter 19, verse 6. Now I will read Matthew chapter 27, verse 30 through 31. And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. And next, the death of Jesus. So that's in Mark chapter 15, verse 33. And I will also read from Luke chapter 23 through uh, 46. So Mark 15, 33, and Luke 23, 46. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And that's Mark chapter 15, 33. And in Luke uh, 23, 46, 
Then Jesus called out with a loud voice saying, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now this is when Jesus is buried. Jesus is buried. So I'll read Matthew 27, Matthew 27, verse 57 through 59. And I will also read John chapter 19, verse 40 through 41. So again, that's Matthew 27, verse 57 through 59, and John chapter 19, verse 40 through 41. So here is Matthew chapter 27, 57 through 59. When it was evening, there came a rich man from uh, Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus, then Pilate ordered it to be given to him, and Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud. Now we'll go to John chapter 19, verse 40 through 41. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen clothes with the spices as is the burial uh, custom of the Jews. Verse 41, now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. And then the resurrection. If there's a scripture to remember on this Resurrection Sunday, it is Luke chapter 24, verse 1 through 6. It is the book of Luke. It is chapter 24, verse 1 through 6. And the scripture reads, But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. So what have I talked about today? I did a lot of talking. Let me tell you what I did. The first thing I did was I gave a logical explanation of Easter. The next thing I did was uh, we talked about the Easter Bible story, very simplified. And then the Easter story was told through scriptures. We just finished that. So let me, let me share this with you. Easter is the annual celebration of Christ's resurrection to life after his crucifixion and death. We know that now because that's in the Bible. We also gave a simplified story. The day is also called Resurrection Sunday. Now, I'm going to give you something to think about. Why is it called Easter. Well, the word Easter is related to the word east, which naturally points to the sunrise, right? To new days and new beginnings. And that's what we celebrate today, new beginnings. And that's the title of our message. Let me share something with you. We have all sinned and deserve God's judgment. God the Father sent his only son to satisfy that judgment for those who believe in him. Jesus, the creator and eternal son of God, who lived a sinless life, loves us so much that he died for our sins, taking the punishment, that's the sacrifice, that we deserve and was buried and rose from the dead as shown in the Bible. If you truly believe and trust in your heart, receiving Jesus alone as your Savior, and declaring Jesus is Lord, you will be saved from judgment and spend eternity with God in heaven. I ask for those here and also sitting in your home, in your pajamas, please rise as we share a closing prayer. And raise your hands. Dear Lord, I have received the word and the understanding and the teaching today of Resurrection Sunday. We thank 
you, Lord, for what you have done for us, and you allow us to have that continued connection with you, Lord. We bless you, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Consider presenting your tithes and offerings online at our website, resurrectionspringfield.org. Our Bible services, uh, our, our church service, I should say, our, is Sundays at noon. Our Bible session is Wednesday at 7. Um, our website is resurrectionspringfield.org. Of course, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TRC413. Check out our videos on YouTube, ResCent Spring, R-E-S-C-E-N-T-S-P-R-I-N-G. We have two radio stations, ResurrectionCenterRadio.com. We also have TheKRadio.com. Text us. Call us. Our phone is 413-342-0354. And if you have a smart device like Alexa, just say, Alexa, play the podcast, Resurrection Center of Springfield. I want to thank you for joining us today at the Resurrection Center. Um, We look forward to opening our church at some time in the future. If you are looking for a church, our location is 1060 Worcester Street. That's 1060 Worcester Street in Springfield, Massachusetts. That's in the Indian Orchard area of Springfield. When we're open, we welcome you. My name is David Ewan, and this is the Resurrection Center. Born and raised in Springfield, Massachusetts, many know this city for its history and innovation. Others know it as a violent, drug-infested city. However, I believe otherwise. Others have tried to come and proclaim this city. They have fallen short. Why? Because this city belongs to God. This city is dear to us because this is the place we call home. You can know our history, but we made our history. A city made out of 17 neighborhoods. The fourth largest city in New England, 
where the faces of the famous decorate the walls of the fifth most popular sport in the world, known as basketball. It's the same place that God has placed us. Springfield doesn't need another church. Springfield is in desperate need of God's presence.